My name is Gary Willis. 50 years ago, I was an Air Force FAC, a forward air controller, using the call sign Red Marker 1-8. The Red Marker FACs supported the elite Vietnamese Airborne Division. That division headquartered in Saigon, but deployed battalions to every combat hotspot in the country. U.S. Army advisors of MACV Team 162, known as the Red Hats, and a Red Marker tactical control party went wherever the Airborne was sent. In 1969, an airborne task force deployed to Phuc Long province on the Cambodian border and began operations around Songbay City, the provincial capital. Songbay's main street had been converted into a small runway, adequate for light aircraft and helicopters, but not big enough for large resupply airplanes. So the task force set up its headquarters at nearby LZ Buttons with its 3,400-foot asphalt runway. The Red Hats and Red Markers built a bunker complex for living quarters at that site. Song Bay and Buttons were the targets of almost daily mortar and rocket attacks, so the bunkers were a necessity. The Red Marker control party at Buttons consisted of two O-1 Bird Dog aircraft and a radio jeep, several facts, two radio operators, and two crew chiefs. Typically, the Red Marker personnel worked there for several weeks before rotating to a different forward location where the Airborne were operating. We took off each morning from Buttons for the first mission of the day, and while we were in the air, our crew chiefs traveled by jeep from Buttons to Songbay City. We landed at the city strip after the first mission, where the crew chiefs refueled and rearmed our planes for the next flight. After the last mission of the day, we landed back at Buttons and the crew chiefs drove back to spend the night in the bunkers. The Songbay City runway was unique. It was oriented north-south. At the south end was a 300-foot gorge leading down to the Songbay River. At the north end was the provincial headquarters, a two-story building with an attached bell tower. That building made landing from the north or taking off to the north impossible. So regardless of wind direction, we always landed from the south and took off to the south. I had one really dicey landing at Song Bay. I made a bad approach with a strong tailwind and could not safely land. So I had to go around for another attempt. I added full throttle and the bird dog struggled to gain altitude. I had to swerve a little bit to the left to dodge the building and I got a really close look into that bell tower. It had a red tile floor. Hello, my name is Jim Yiannopoulos. I was a sergeant in the Air Force, a radio operator, and I was assigned uh, to the advisory team 162 of the Vietnamese Airborne Division from 1970 and part of 1971. I grew up in the military. My dad was a military officer. He was a pilot, flew in World War II in Korea. So I, I, my entire existence to that point was associated with the military. I had uh, finished college and uh, was uh, trying to get a job and the war was in full swing and so I volunteered and, and joined the Air Force uh, to serve my country uh, and then get out and then go back into probably education. I wanted to be a counselor. My daily life in Vietnam, to give you an idea of what we did, as radio operators, we worked shift work. Uh, there were always two, two radio operators assigned uh, we'd go out for three weeks to uh, fire support bases or A camps. I always volunteered to stay out longer, which was a great trade-off because a lot of the guys didn't want to do that. I stayed at the base camp. I stayed at those fire support bases and those A camps. Uh, my, my most of my duration 
in Vietnam. I spent very little time in Saigon and very little time back at those large uh, fire support bases. Uh, the story I wanted to tell you happened, uh, I'm going to say, in the uh, March, April time frame of 1970. I was at, at this time, on this location, I was back out, out of the A camp, was back down at Song Bay, which <laughs> which was a fire support base. Uh, and and uh, it was uh, it was up in the highlands and those mountains. And I had a monkey, and my monkey was uh, my buddy. Uh, some army guy gave it to me because he had to rotate, and the army didn't like uh, the monkey didn't like anybody uh, who wasn't an American, and he didn't like anybody who other than me because I fed him, and that's the only reason he he tolerated me. But I had my long chain, and so I was sitting under this thing. Give you an idea when we worked half days, uh, one of us would work in the morning, one in the afternoon. And the other time you'd sit in your area and read books uh, or play games, whatever you could do to, to pass the time. And so uh, that afternoon I was sitting there under this tarpaulin. We had a big ice chest a container. It was an old Coca-Cola container box. And we kept our, our sodas in there and we kept ice in there where we could get it. And uh, so I had the monkey was, was sort of our guard. He was on this long chain. He didn't let anybody come around because when we were all gone, our Vietnamese counterparts would sneak in and steal our sodas. So anyway, he was a good good watchdog, good watch monkey. I was sitting there shooting, I had a BB gun. We had a, I don't know where they came from. They were there on the on the compound with us. Uh, somebody had brought two Daisy Air Rifles, had a wooden stock and a metal barrel and a metal lever, you know, to cock them and all this kind of stuff. And so I was sitting there and I was actually shooting cigarette butts about 10 feet away, 15 feet away. And... My monkey started acting really strange, and so I got up, find out what he was doing and what he was looking at. I go around the bunker, and sure enough, there's a Vietnamese. And he has on a little pith helmet, not a helmet, but a hat, let's call them jungle caps. And he had on a uh, uh, olive-colored T-shirt and, and shorts, and he had on some sandals. And that's all he had, and he was he was looking around, and I asked him, I said, hey, what are you doing? And he looked at me, and Hey, come here. What are you doing? Lot of you. Over here now. And I had that BB gun and he kept looking at that BB gun, but he he and then he listened to me and then he finally so so I taught motion for him to come and he the closer he got, then he put his hands up. Then he put his hands on his head. And I thought, what the heck? So anyway, we come around to the compound and I'm inside the underneath the tarpaulin and get him in there. And I had my monkey tied down so he wouldn't attack him. And and I'm asking this guy, who are you? Where do you? And he didn't understand anything. And I couldn't speak enough Vietnamese to help the situation. So it seemed like, you know, looking back now, it's like time stood still. It seemed like hours went by when actually probably, probably about a 10 or 15 minute period. But I thought, well, he keeps looking at this gun. And I kept telling him, come in, come in. He said, and he squats down and he's got his hands over his head. And I'm like, oh man, now what, you know? And so... I said, well, I better get my 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 M16 because if if he's got something under that hat or he tries to attack me, best I can do is beat him down with this this gun because it won't shoot anything but BBs. Uh, so let me grab my M16. So I started in the bunker to get it, and it, and I started in, and as I thought, no, something's wrong. I looked out, and sure enough, he was running. So I yelled at him, and he turned around. He was now, but he was about 20. I'm gonna say maybe 10 yards, 20 20 yards away. And I'm yelling at him, and he's so finally he comes, he he turns around, and finally said, so I cocked that gun. <laughs> and I knew at that at that distance he couldn't hear any any BBs rolling around. So when I cocked it, he comes running back, and then he squats down and puts his hands on his head, and then finally the Vietnamese showed up, and took him away, and I continued then to shoot my my uh, cigarette butts. That evening at our evening meal, we had with the Vietnamese would cook our meal. The sergeant major came, and he said, hey, I want to. I thank you for uh, capturing uh, this uh, NVA. And I said, NVA? And he said, yeah, he was, a, he was a North Vietnamese regular army colonel, lieutenant colonel, excuse me, lieutenant colonel. And he had come in during the day with the Vietnamese uh, who they would hire to come in and, and pick bodies up off the wire uh, that surrounded the base camp for burial uh, from the... Uh, from the uh, attack the night before and we get attacked every night so they would that's what happened so he came in with them in the morning and this was about three or four in the afternoon so he'd been there a long time and he had sketched out a little map of every every area on that base camp uh where the where the artillery unit was 
where the helicopters were, where the fuel bladders were for the helicopters, where our uh, Vietnamese airborne unit was, where the TOC, the, the uh, command operations uh, center was, tactical operations center was. And uh, he had all that done. So I guess looking back, we probably saved a bunch of lives. And uh, it's kind of a scary thing to think that you catch somebody that's really going to try to kill you. Thank you. My name is James Hoppy. People call me Hoppy. I was one of two crew chiefs who worked at Song Bay Buttons forward basis in May of 1970. As a Green Airman First Class reciprocating aircraft mechanic, I was assigned to perform the maintenance on the 201 Bird Dog aircrafts at Song Bay Buttons. The base was primitive in terms of maintenance and living conditions. We did our best to repair and maintain our two aircraft. We also built Willie Pete rockets and gas the birds, sometimes with five gallon jerry cans. There were not many major aircraft repairs done at this location. Those types of repairs would be at dock maintenance at Benoit Air Force Base. Lieutenant Gary Willits was one of the pilots I remember working closely with and he was someone who I greatly respected. Some of his missions were scary. One of his missions had me in his back seat. Crew chiefs could fly in the back seat on some missions and pilots loved to say that four eyes up there are a lot better than two eyes. Those missions were hectic though. The pilot had to balance all the work he was doing during the mission while trying to keep everything straight up there at 1,500 feet. He was acting as his own air traffic controller with the Viet Cong shooting up at him. On one occasion, I accompanied Lieutenant Willits on a mission that was made, that made me a believer in God in that back seat. I was truly scared. It all started when I noticed large flashes on the ground at three o'clock. I yelled to the Lieutenant that I had spotted ground fire coming up at us. They were firing 37 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Even scarier was the fact that there was no armor in the back seat, only radio equipment. To outmaneuver the Viet Cong gunners, Lieutenant Willis immediately put the O-1 in to some unbelievable aerobatic moves. Thankfully, God did not want us that day. We prevailed and returned safely to the base. I am Lieutenant Colonel Barry Shoup, U.S. Army, retired. During the entirety of 1969, as an airborne qualified U.S. Air Force Sergeant and ground radio operator, I was assigned to the Tactical Air Control Party known as Red Marker and attached to MACV Advisory Team 162, Arvin Airborne Division. During most of 1969, Red Marker's area of operation was Tainan Province with radio operators and aircraft crew chiefs rotating in and out of two locations. Radio operators from a Tainan province government estate and the crew chiefs out of Tainan base camp. It was summer of 1969 when enemy activity in the Tainan area had declined to a level where other Arvin units could assume tactical responsibility and the 1st Brigade of the Arvin Airborne Division could be redeployed in response to increasing enemy activity in Song Bay of Phuc Binh District. Movement was a multi-day operation. As I recall, a number of nights when, along the route, defensive positions had to be prepared in order to safely and efficiently conduct night operations. When we finally arrived at LZ Buttons, our advanced detachment had arranged to have engineers regrade a several acre lot containing a few vacant bunkers that was next to a helicopter landing zone. That grading established a six to seven foot high berm around the area, giving us a level of dispersion and cover from direct fire, as well as easy access and egress. The engineers also delivered truckloads of pre-filled sandbags, empty wooden artillery round boxes, corrugated steel culvert, 
perforated steel planking known as PSP, a few bundles of unfilled sandbags and, uh, and fill for those sandbags and artillery boxes. The brigade had established its tactical operations center in a large nearby bunker, and while other brigade personnel set about filling sandbags and shell boxes, the TACP's VHF, UHF, HF, and FM radio equipment had to be removed from its Mark 108 communications platform and installed in the talk. Although all the antennae were installed on the roof of the talk, care had to be taken to protect them and their transmission and power cables from accidental damage, incoming, or sabotage. Further care was necessary to ensure the HF antenna was out of reach because it was a bare wire emitting RF energy capable of burning a person making contact with the antenna during a transmission. Once communication was established, activity centered on building more bunkers, essentially our personal protection and sleeping areas. The task, while laborious, was fairly swift given the hundreds, if not thousands, of pre-filled sandbags and shells, shell boxes provided by the engineers. The empty sandbags and shell boxes were filled and used first to reinforce vulnerable areas, then in conjunction with PSP and culvert, they were used to improve and expand overhead and weather protection. This proved a valuable investment as LZ Buttons was a frequent target of nighttime mortar and rocket attack, as well as random small arms fire and penetration attempts. Personal conveniences in and around our cantonment were standard 1960s field operations. Dining was in field mess tents, but sea rations were also readily available. Drinking water was provided from strategically placed potable water trailers. Showers were large water tanks placed above simple wooden enclosures and filled by water tankers or the occasional rain. Latrines were portage-on-like enclosures from which the refuse containers were regularly withdrawn and the contents burned. Lighting was fairly limited to gasoline-fueled lanterns, although since batteries were readily available, a persuasive person could easily visit a stripe, uh, an airstrip and liberate one of the battery-operated markers pathfinders used to light landing and drop zones. I operated in and out of LZ buttons until shortly after New Year 1970 when I out-processed and rotated back to the United States. I thank you for the, the speaking opportunity. It was a pleasure to be able to reminisce a bit and share with you one of my many wartime experiences. In a normal mission, we flew for several hours at 1,500 feet above, above the Airborne's AO, its area of operations. During the flight, we stayed in radio contact with Red Marker Control, our radio operator back in the Tactical Operations Center at Buttons. When we got to the AO, we contacted the Red Hat advisor on the ground with the troops and stayed in contact with him until we left the area. We usually controlled one or more pre-planned airstrikes on each mission. These strikes were based on intelligence reports of likely VC or NVA positions. That same intelligence was used, by the way, to plan the Airborne's ground sweeps to try to find and destroy the enemy. More often than not, the Airborne found and attacked the VC or the NVA, and the Red Hat advisor would request an immediate airstrike to assist in their firefight. We relayed that request to Marker Control, who radioed it to the Direct Air Support Center in Saigon. The center scrambled strike air force aircraft that were standing alert and sent them to rendezvous at our location. These fighter bombers arrived in short order at an altitude several thousand feet above us. They could spot our low-flying bird dog because the top of our wing was painted bright white to stand out against the jungle below. The fighters checked in with us and orbited overhead while we set up the strike. Controlling an airstrike with troops in contact required the utmost precision by the FAC and the strike aircraft. We dictated attack headings to avoid overflying the friendlies and instructed the fighters 
on the safest bailout area should they be hit. We directed the order of the ordnance to be dropped, usually hard bombs first, followed by napalm after some of the trees had been blown away. Last, we would direct them to make a strafing run with 20 millimeter cannon. After briefing the fighters, we called for the airborne to pop colored smoke grenades to mark their positions. We then wheeled the bird dog into a wing over and a 45 degree angle dive, firing a white phosphorus smoke rocket to mark the target. The lead fighter would roll in on his bomb run and identify the color of the friendly smoke and the white smoke marking the target. My radio call to the lead was then, cleared in hot, hit my smoke. As he pulled off target, number two would roll in and identify the friendly smoke. I would clear him hot, usually adjusting his aim point to the left or right, or long or short, of Leeds' bomb impact, the object being to move the bombs around to saturate the target. After a couple of bomb runs, I would hold the fighters high and dry and inspect the damage before continuing the rest of the attack. Often we got feedback from the red hat on the ground telling us we were right on target or to adjust the bombs one way or another, sometimes calling for them closer. An NVA tactic was to try to get as close as possible to our troops, hoping that would protect them from an air attack. It took guts on the part of the red hat and a lot of trust in us to bring the bombs closer to his line. On another one of those backseat missions, I noticed a great river pool down in the canyon at the runway's end as we took off from Song Bay. In the pool were Vietnamese women bathing. It was a good 300 feet below the runway and you could access it by a small road nearby. A couple of days later, I got three enlisted GIs to accompany me in a Jeep to the pool. We wanted to explore the pool, as you might guess, meet some young Vietnamese babes. We were stupid in those days. I had only seen the pool from the air and being young and dumb, we had no sense for any danger that might be lurking. We arrived at the pool with no problem, but then someone opened fire on us with a small arms fire as we got out of the Jeep. There were no girls around and we shot off a few rounds back in defense. We never did see the source of the gunfire, although we hauled ass back in the Jeep and eventually made it back to the safety of Song Bay maintenance sheds. We never did get to see the Vietnamese beauties. It was another great move by dumb enlisted guys. Thank you. We seldom flew at night because the O-1 was not well equipped for such duty. It did not have the best instruments or navigation aids. But one night, the Red Hat officer on duty at Buttons came into the bunker and said he had a company in a tough fight and wondered if anyone would volunteer to fly a mission. The senior fac on site, First Lieutenant Terry Weaver, said sure. Terry asked if anyone was willing to go with him and ride in the back seat. I was relatively new in country and said sure, let's go and grabbed my gear. We flew blacked out to the approximate location of the embattled company. The red hat on the ground could not see us, but could hear us. Weaver flew a pattern back and forth until the red hat told him we were right overhead. Terry then took up an orbit over the friendly position. A flight of two F-100s checked in shortly. Terry turned on his rotating beacon for a few seconds so the fighters could locate us and then brief them on the situation. There was enough moonlight that night so that everyone could see the friendly smoke when Terry called for them to mark their positions. He then rolled in and fired a smoke rocket about 100 meters from the airborne front lines. At that point, and just as Lead is rolling in for his bomb run, an enemy 51 caliber machine gun opened up on us. As the tracers flew by, Terry calmly asked if Lead had the location of the gun in sight. Affirmative, Red Marker, said Lead. Weaver replied, ignore my smoke and hit the gun. Cleared hot. Lead silenced the gun in one pass, and Red Hat yelled over the radio, outstanding, hit him again. 
They are running. Weaver directed the second fighter to aim 20 meters to the right of Lead's bombs. On subsequent passes, he walked the bombs further and further away from the airborne lines, chasing the enemy's retreat. The Red Hat put Terry in for a well-earned medal for that mission. I controlled hundreds of airstrikes during my tour, but I never forgot that night mission near Song Bay. Troops in contact, no flare ship, no margin for error, attack in the moonlight and in the face of ground fire, and it was a success.